Hi everyone, uh, this is Venkat and I'm talking on behalf of Edina. Edina is a Kannada media house. It's a community media house. It's built to give voices to the community. And today I have an extremely pleasurable, very happy to have TM Krishna with us. It's very difficult and it's a tall order to introduce him, but I'll do a sh I'll try to do that. Uh, many years ago when Richard Feynman was asked if he was looking for the ultimate truth in physics, he mentioned no, maybe not. And he said maybe the world would reveal itself as we peel onions one after the other, and maybe that's how the world reveals itself. And he said science was his way to get to that sort of truth and process. A few weeks ago, a TMK said that the idea of a question uh, need not be an answer. It needs to be a question so that there is a journey. And he used the same example of onion peeling again and again. In many ways, uh, many of his work has been from one question to the other. So hoping that this interview will be about questions and he'll leave us with more questions on on that order and that's how i think his personal career also has been many years ago when you went to chennai attending his fest attending his concert was a big thing at some point he distanced himself and started talking about uh, the format the aesthetics then people were included and interestingly those who are not included uh, and then started talking about the whole idea of who gets included the politics of it the idea of caste in it, and then about social justice. So uh, we would like to have an interactive session with him to hear from him more questions, if not answers, because that's how he described himself. So thank you again. It's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, on our community media house, Idina. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. And I must tell you, I watch all your videos and I thank you for all the work that all of you are putting in. Uh, thank you. I mean, uh, we learn a lot from the conversations that you host. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the first question will be, given that the elections have just got over, the results have come. What is your first overall reaction to this result? Well, truth be told, even before the elections, I think many of us who were uh, deeply uncomfortable with uh, Narendra Modi government were hoping for checks and balances. I don't think, uh, I don't think we were saying, you know, uh, reality didn't seem like there's going to be an entire change in in uh, party that's governing this country. So we were hoping for a good fight. We were hoping that the, or the parliament will be truly uh, a place where debate will happen, where bills will be discussed, where um, there will be there'll be human relationships between parliamentarians. Uh, we have lost humanity in parliament over the last 10 years i'm not saying everything is everything was hunky dory before but i think even the exchange of ideas exchange of disagreements to so say that we are we disagree on ideology everything but we are here to do something together that was entirely demolished by the narendra modi government without doubt so we were hoping hoping for a good checks and balances result and i think we did get it uh, there's no doubt about it that we got it. Uh, probably we got it even better than what we initially thought in the early 2024 January compared to what finally came out. So we should be very happy. So there is a relief without doubt. Uh, there is a feeling. I mean, my, I'm, many people have said this and I'm going to say it. You did feel that you were breathing easier. Right. How much this is going to be true is a different question. For example, as we speak now. Uh, Arundhati Roy is, uh, you know, uh, the uh, LG has given sanction to basically move the case forward, a 2010 case against Arundhati Roy. So, I mean, how much of this is reality? How much of this is momentary euphoria uh, that we, we had? We have a place on the table. I don't know, but the feeling is true. Feeling is very true. But I want to say a few more things, Venkat, if that's okay with you. I think I, think I put this out on Twitter. And especially as a South Indian, as a Tamil uh, liberal progressive, label me however you want. Um, we always had this feeling that the Hindi belt was pulling democracy down in this country. That they are of no hope. You know, there's no education there. There is no uh, health there. And, uh, you know, they, they fall for, I mean, they fall for all these uh, you know, charades and all these things. But the fact of the matter is, and we have to acknowledge it with great humility, that Uttar Pradesh did something that no one expected. And I think it's, it's important to then rethink on how even we stereotype people of 
within the courts, the Hindi belt. Because if as South Indians, we want, we are looking at this country of coexistence, looking at, we are all participating in this democracy. Our perceptions and our communication and our discussions with our friends and co-citizens and partners across this country also needs to change. This is both at the level of the citizenry and both at the level of politicians. I think, I think that's also, a, for me personally, I think that was a lesson. Yes, we know that emergency, emergency time, UP Bihar was very important. JP pretty much was from that area, all that we know. And I'm sure that'll be recalled when somebody watches this video. But the fact is over the last 20, 30 years, we have, we have felt really that you know, democracy somehow is more awake and alive in the coastal and southern belts where the Hindi belt has given up. I think that kind of stereotyping has not done us good, even within the liberal and progressive world. It has not done us good. We are actually handing things on the platter the moment we play that, that kind of a differentiated game. So that's two. Two more things to say, if you don't mind. I know it's a long winded answer. But, you know, at a philosophical level for me, this whole idea of what a win and what a loss is, I think that really raised, that really came back to me. Uh, because I have grown up uh, in a, in a J. Krishnamurti school, in an environment where competition was, was not necessarily a thing that you looked for in life or in anything that you did. So the whole idea of being the first, winning, higher marks, all these things were things that we discussed. And I think this election actually raised those very important questions. What is a win? Uh, when has somebody really won? Why uh, Why does the BJP almost have a face that says that they lost? You know, whereas the Congress is celebrating 99 or 100 out of 500 and odd. So, I mean, so the question is also that, right? So what makes you feel you're strong? What makes you feel you're, you, are this, you are powerful and you can do whatever you want? What makes you feel you have won? I think these are very serious political questions, not just philosophical questions that we have to ask ourselves. And this election, interestingly, the people of India have give it, gifted us an opportunity to ask deeper questions of victory, deeper questions of loss. And I think that at a larger political level, this whole idea of somebody winning because they are first past the post is something I think we all need to rethink. I'm not... I'm not a votary. I'm not saying immediately go proportional representation. I'm not, I'm not a political scientist by any stretch of uh, imagination. But this whole idea that if you got one more vote than me, you represent everybody is fundamentally flawed. Let's, let's accept that. And it's worse in a society that is so discriminated, that is so segregated, that where power and feudal operations, caste operations, gender operations dominate in such a manner. And as we saw in this election, when media, money, uh, you know, ED, name it, every, every uh, part, every, what is a mechanism is at your disposal. Where is that? Where is there a checks and balance in the process of participating in that election as a citizen of this country? So, and we always know that the number of seats in a parliament, visa, we vote share is always something we're not able to reconcile. Correct, correct. You know, yes. actually, let's be honest, forget about the political system. You can't reconcile it. Uh, you know, so I think we need some creativity here. If we are a society that says equity is important in society, is there equity in our electoral process? And I want to say one more thing. There are, I think, if my memory is right, I read it somewhere, there are only seven independent candidates in 500 and odd seats in parliament. We say we are electing representatives to the parliament. We are not supposed to be presently electing political parties. But are we really re uh, electing representatives? If there are only seven, isn't it an uneven playing ground? If I want to stand for election, I am fundamentally at my in my back foot on my back foot so how is it a leveling level playing field for every candidate forget about money i'm just saying about imagery i really think that this is my opinion that political symbols should have an expiry date i think after a point of time the party needs to change its symbol because the political symbol carries historical social cultural baggage and weight 
and that is an undue benefit for an older party right yeah. so i think there needs to be a way by which every x number of years every political party has to find a new image for itself if i if you stand for election and say a mobile phone is your symbol nobody has registry of the mobile phone so you have 10 years if you start a political party to establish a symbol forget about your ideology or perception or your ideas so stuff like this has to be thought about there has to be more creativity yes absolutely I, you reminded me of something which my teacher had said he, he was from bihar and he said ye desh uh, nirgun ram ka bhi hai sagun ka bhi hai sankracharya ka bhi hai kabir ka bhi he had said True. that he had a profound influence on the way i think and talk so uh, it just reminded me of that like up and this and this question which you put forward and i think it's another thing to provoke ourselves about it yeah. uh, the next one would be I, I think people have said this i mean i keep the example of lagan it was like Bhuvan fighting the East India Company. It seemed like the the social media, the artists, uh, the influencers, whether it's Ravi, Dhruv, uh, each of them worked so hard. Yeah. To It was as if this Bhuvan's team had come across. Do you think it was also an uneven battle? And hence, the sort of stuff you said, who wins, who loses, comes across more prominently in this one? It was, I mean, let's be very honest. It was, a, it was a terribly uneven battle. It was not even marginally uneven. I mean, uh, the state machinery was at the disposal uh, and uh, the prime minister was allowed to say things that he sh never should have been allowed to say, uh, you know, things. I mean, language use, the powers that they had in hand, the money that we know uh, the BJP had made this completely skewed in many ways. So despite that, I think is when uh, the happiness comes from, despite all this. Right. And I think the participation of individuals and society and people cannot be underestimated in this victory it is a very important aspect that needs to be acknowledged that tremendous amount of energy and you know it's that's also a very interesting thing of it you know social media is, is a set of multiple silos that's what it is right so uh it how much seepage happens between one silo and another is something i don't think we have enough data on the algorithm probably doesn't want you to see that because they want the silo to be built right mm -hmm. but now, despite that, how did this happen? Is another interesting question to be asked. So, is the silo become stronger? Is the silo become more vocal? Are there, uh, or as I suggested, are there people moving from one silo to another? So, there in social media, because voting is a lot also about the perception game, as much as it is about realities of my life or your life or a community's life. It's also about perception, right? The other thing I think we need to give credit to is the opposition. I mean, we have to give credit to them. So many differences in the India Alliance, very different, all that. So two things. One is I think for the first time, they did not fall into the trap that the BJP lays out every time. That this is a battle between Narendra Modi and a nobody. They did not fall for it. This is the first time strategically they did something very different. And I think that credit has to be given to the opposition also. And they, you know, there's something actually I've been crying host for a long time, saying that parties should fight the national election that it like it's a local election. You know, don't fight it like a national election. Fight it with as a local election because that federalism and state elections prove that local uh, problems are something that really draws people. And I think they really did that. The third thing is regional parties. Their work in this election is unprecedented. And what they have actually done is unprecedented. The last thing which we are not talking enough about, which I think is unfair to this, this gentleman, and the gentleman in Indian politics will be still called young, is Mr. Rahul Gandhi and his Bharat Jodo Yatras has to be acknowledged. He was poo pooed not only by the BJP, but by liberal intellectuals, by like progressives, you know, for years and years. But this man stuck it out, stuck his net out. He walked the length and breadth of this country. I mean, that is quite astounding. How come we're not talking about that simple act?
that somebody walked the length and breadth of this country. I don't need to be a supporter of the Congress party or Mr. Rahul Gandhi for just acknowledging there is some, there is a, there is a self-sacrifice in that act. And I think there is something important to acknowledge there. Whether they converted exactly to votes, I know people are doing the data mining for that. I am not. But I'm saying in terms of, again, perception, imagery, what it meant, what it says, I think Rahul Gandhi also needs to be credited uh, uh, for the effort and for really being undeterred by very low level of critique and of... Uh, you know, at points, abuse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for laying it. I, I will go back to something like the journey from now on, but I want to pick up something uh, which have always been in my mind. Uh, years before when uh, there was a hanging uh, and you went back to Hindu and wrote an article about how uh, celebrating and hanging of a person uh, is something wrong. And it seemed like you were signaling very early, this is quite early, that something is wrong about this kind of celebration. And we have seen that. And I would nearly connect the fact that we garlanded Bilkis Banu is yeah. of that kind of a journey. Yeah. Yeah. When you indicating that, could you tell me what went uh, into your mind when you wrote that? And did you see some deterioration that trajectory? Yeah, I mean, um, I remember that image in the, in the newspaper, if I remember right, where uh, people were celebrating the hanging of an individual. And it did something to my stomach immediately. Now, it's not about who the individual is or anything. Let's, that's, that's actually irrelevant to what I felt. It was something about us feeling happy that somebody was being, within courts, legally killed. That is exactly what the death sentence is. It's a legal, legally approved, sorry, legally sanctioned killing of an individual. And I was wondering, I mean, do we really do that? If I saw, for example, anybody being shot in front of me, would I celebrate? I would not celebrate. Right? So there is some, what is it about life and what is it about death? Right? There's something about the gift of life. The gift of life is all its messiness, all its horrible things, all its good things, all the beautiful, everything. But it's about the grappling of all this that life is. That's a gift. And in that life, you grapple also with violence. Of course you do. No, but when you take away somebody's existence willfully, there is, some, there is a line you're crossing, a line beyond life, a line beyond a chance, you know. And there is something, and I felt there was something honestly, you know, it was almost like we had devilish about it, about celebrating that, about killing somebody, something devilish. You know, if somebody, if, if there was a person who was constantly killing and walking around town, you would call him a psychopath, right? Because the person does not feel anything about, you know, killing somebody. Now, when we celebrate the hanging of a person, in some ways we are tapping into that very, very base aspect of us. Very base aspect. Or, you know, and therefore it did something deeply to me, you know. There's a very famous uh, essay by Camus, which I go back to a lot about the death sentence. And uh, he asked, actually asked this question. He says, why is the death sentence always done in the middle of the night or early morning, hidden in some room? Why don't they do it in public? If it is something we all should agree upon, that this individual needs to be hung or, you know, uh, put to death by injection or whatever the process may be. Why don't we telecast it all over the country and, you know, like watching a television show? Why don't we watch it? Because while watching that death, we don't want to watch it. It, it, it does something to us fundamentally. So we hide it away, away from the eyes. And you're celebrating what? Something you have not even seen. You don't know where the body shook. You don't know how the neck snapped. You don't know whether, you don't know any of that. So there is, there is something inhuman, something that strips you of any, any basic level of decency when you put somebody to death. And I believe we don't have a right to kill anybody for any reason. 
also though it is part of our law books now i don't believe that that sentence is justice that that sentence is simply catering to our baser instinct of revenge and retribution that's all it is it is not justice because justice is something else justice is not about it is not about the victim or the uh, the violent uh, person it is not about those two people that's the most incredible thing about justice justice is a morality it's about a humaneness it's about be being just means what it is about weighing the various aspects of life of society of what even the act of giving a person a certain punishment does to larger society that is also important in justice yes it is not a case it is not just the case it is it is talking to society that's what justice should do and a, a, a just verdict must make us feel that we are moving in the direction of being ethical that's what justice is you know that way scale is not is not at all it's it's here justice must make us better people justice must not tell us yeah we killed somebody there's something wrong there is something wrong and i think i felt it then and as you said when you are going to be give sweets to somebody who came out uh, after you know uh, bilki banu's case what is going on here what are we saying to ourselves if in humaneness you know this whole act of what aboutry that we see today there is something inhuman about what aboutry we think we talk about you know we use that word if we you know on on conversations on twitter we say you know don't do what no it's not possible you know when i see what aboutry it does there's something philosophically problematic about because you are immediately doing one thing you are weighing two deaths yes yes so that way scale justice way scale now has two killings on it or it has a number put on each killing here 100 people died here 20 people died which is more important or it has religion put on it or it has caste put on it gender put on it that's what that way scale becomes way that is retribution that's a comparison of retribution of revenge so somebody who has more power to kill more people out of revenge i don't know so when you know for example when we when we talk about palestine i mean how can we have a conversation without talking about palestine the moment you raise palestine somebody is talking about somebody else that's not it every context has a has a story every context has history we have to understand that not to justify anything but to feel better feel better in the sense understand better the situation let me clarify yeah. you know feel in a manner that's deeper so i think there was i felt even at that time there was something drastically wrong about celebrating the hanging of any individual also you know in you know i you know another case you know sometimes one act defines that entire person's life you know i done that i do some little work in a prison and i have met inmates who have been there for various who are in there for various reasons you know sometimes you wonder one act a 30 second act which is a terrible violent horrible act becomes the entire definition of that individual how we sure that's how we want to see justice is my question are we sure how we want to see that individual is the question we have to ask it is a larger deeper question imagine a country like rwanda i keep using that example country that had genocide at a scale that you and i can't imagine does not have the death penalty what does that say about that justice system what does that say what is the learning of those people who said i don't want the death penalty what there is they they are saying something to the larger world not just to themselves are we listening i i i love to how i i think that's a part of some of your debates and talk is that individual and the society and you connect 
uh, the two, like the death sentence, the people, the justice in the system. Uh, I, I want to take you to something you've been close to. Can art be a passive observer of things or being a passive itself itself is a political statement? Yeah, I mean, art is never passive. That's just, just that's nonsensical at a very, very basic level. How is it passive? It's an act. Let's strip it down. Okay. Art is an act. An act involves a large process of things, which is learning, experience, thought, action. And uh, that thought I'm talking about is the thought before the act of creation. But before that, you have, ex you have learning, you have experience, you're picking up. All that leads to a point of thought. And that thought then overflows into a creative object, what I call an art object. In nowhere in this, nothing of this, none of this whole series of things is non-political. They're all political. What I experience, how I experience, who I experience with, what I don't experience, where do, what do I see, what don't I see, what will I see, what will I eat, what will I listen to, what do I like, what do I dislike, what do I think is beautiful, which color will I use in my canvas. Tell me one thing in this which is non-political and I'll stop doing art the next day. Everything is sounds. What sound is musical? What is in tune? What is not in tune? What, what, what dialect should I use in my song? Which words should be repeated more times? Which songs evoke me? Your most deepest emotional experience are political experiences. They may be profound, but they're still political. We have a problem in this country. We think, especially the caste privileged middle class thing, politics is somehow a word that is dirty. And they also think in this, in that the, they have the way we have, we have, sorry, I'm the same part of the same group. We have a very confused sense of uh, spiritual upliftment or spiritual growth and politics. Now, so if we say that we are spiritually inclined, Whatever that may mean, whatever philosophy, I don't, I mean, I'm, that's not, it doesn't interest me at this point. We can't say we're political because this makes us beyond politics. No, boss, you choosing a certain uh, way of spiritual growth is political. Yeah. That itself is political. You listening to one great seer, but not another seer is political. So even your philosophical, spiritual quest is a political act and there's nothing wrong with it. That's what I'm trying to say. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. The arguments that you will make against, say, atheism are political arguments. So art can never be non-political. It can never be passive. Even that's wrong. When an artist says they're passive, no. You are not passive. You are active. You are saying something. I may disagree with you. I may agree with you. That's completely different. But you are saying something actively. You are saying something. So therefore, this non-politicization, don't politicize art. You know, these are all these terms. Or the other term, which I also want to flag here, art for art's sake. And I always ask one question when somebody says this to me. Say art for art's sake. Please tell me what's art's sake. Explain art's sake for me. And then I will understand what art for that is. They can't answer that question. You can't answer that question. Because who defines art's sake? You and me. And we are political beings. So art cannot be a silo of self-fulfillment that is completely disconnected from reality, not the world, reality. It's happening on terra firma, it is temporal, it is material, and it is done by the human species. Art is a creation of human beings. Art is not there out there. We created art. I think that's the fundamental starting point for this conversation. Art is everywhere. No, art is a human endeavor. It does not just exist. Art does not exist in nature. Let me be very clear. Just because you find something pretty or beautiful does not make it art. Art exists because human beings created art. Why? Because they thought that's a beautiful, that's an interesting, beautiful, complicated, messy way of abstracting reality in a manner that you can't see 
in everyday life. In fact, art does things that even nature cannot do. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. So one of the things when you say art does things which uh, this reality cannot do, um, during this protest era of like protests in the last five, six years, farmers protest created something like 2000 music and many of them played an important role during the CA protest. Ham Dekhenge became important. Yeah. You think it also archives descent of those times and how do you how do you uh, explain that? Part? I, mean, absolutely. I mean, I was at Shaheen Bagh. I mean, I sang at Shaheen Bagh and I sang Ham Dekhenge in four languages, you know, uh, for the first time I, I sang it in uh, in its original uh, Hindi, uh, Hindi Urdu and then uh, Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil. And uh, it not only does it, so there are two things, right? Uh, in terms of protests and in terms of uh, directly political social action, let's call it that, art has a specific role. Also, remember, art has different roles in different spaces, in different mm -hmm. hands. It's, you can't homogenize that uh, also. That's the whole interesting debate on art. Um, so it had very, very direct role. And, and I think Ham Dekhenge is a very interesting story. It's a song that got a new life in a new context, a new meaning, a new environment after what decades from nowhere. So is it the same song? That's a fascinating question to ask. Is it the same Ham Dekhenge? Or is it a different Ham Dekhenge? To me, it's a different Ham Dekhenge. It has a different meaning. So the same words, the same tune, meaning changes. So I think it was fascinating to watch also the number of songs, even the visual art in, in that you saw at Shaheen Bagh, for example, you know, were all not just registries of that moment. They are registries of the moment, but they are also um, nudging us all towards a continuum of, of movement, of seeking, you know, and I, you know, I, I'd like to bring uh, a very important aspect that these seekings are not something you said about the personal society too. These seekings are not just the seeking of expecting you or the other person to change or do something. But I think in the process, the seeking, you are also hoping to change. Every participant is also learning. Every participant is also hopefully progressing in a direction of a more beautiful space society people. So it's this I think the beauty of this is this interaction between your own change, your own participation, your own action, and also nudging, asking questions that are directly of that moment. So I think because of that, it's not only stopped with that moment. That's why it survives. Why did Hamde Kinge survive for three decades or four decades? Because it was not just about that moment. It also spoke beyond the movement, uh, moment and beyond an individual. It's not just about Zia ul Haq. Yeah. It's about an idea. The idea of protest, the idea of asking difficult questions, the idea of oppression, the idea of freedom, speech, faith, everything. And so it, it always finds movement in different voices. So I may sing something today. Somebody else picks it up and takes it in a direction that I never thought for it. And I think that's what these movements also do. These movements are not over. Those songs are not over. Those poems are not over. Those visual arts are not over. They are constantly moving. You and I may not see it till another incident happens. That's also our lacuna. That we are not participating in art beyond an incident. Why are you and I only talking about the songs that happened during the protest? Songs were happening before that. You and I never listened to them. Maybe if we had listened to them, we wouldn't need for the protest. Let's ask that question. If yeah. we listen to the songs that were sung in the villages by farmers, if we listen to the realities of their life, if we listen to what life experience was for them through their poetry and songs for the last 30 years, would we be in a situation where they had to be on the roads? Isn't that the more important question we should also ask? So by ignoring realities and, and lives that are expressed through art, we are actually pushing people to come together at a moment and then listen, I have a song to sing. Listen, I have a poem to write. Listen, I have art to show. Why do we wait for that? Look, really beautiful. I take two words, the moment as the word and the movement. There are two movements. One is the art itself and the political movement. So I, I take these two words and the sort of thing you, you tied them all together. It was a very beautiful 
uh, expression in itself. Um, there is something which people tend to ask. I, I remember Jan Timanch was asked, what, does, uh, what is your impact of doing this work for the last 30 years? Uh, it was an amazing answer, but I would like to ask you, you've been in the forefront of many um, questioning, I think it leads to more questioning, but I would want your reply, what does art do to us? I mean, does it have the moment and moment if you can take that? Listen, I like first say art by itself does nothing. We do it. Okay. There's, I, I'm not saying this in any egotistical manner about myself, but art by itself, what? No. So the art the question is, what is the intention in making art? And that's a human endeavor. That is an artist's endeavor. That's a community's endeavor. That's also, by the way, the recipient's endeavor. So for art to do something, there has to be a participation and intention first from the artist. Which means the artist is, like you said, moving in some direction is learning in from multiple spaces one and also as a receiver you're participating in that journey when you go to a performance say music performance because i'm a singer you're not just consuming that evening's product you're participating in an evening of pause in the journey of art creation of that artist it's the pause that you are participating in. The pause is that evening's happening. Right? So, I believe art by itself cannot do anything unless we are we want it to do something. One. This, you know, people have also asked me, you know, Yo, you've been doing all this. Tell me what happened. You know, and the corporate world, you know, always wants to quantify everything. Right? What is that? You use a word for it. I'm not getting it now. API? Sorry? API? Exactly, exactly. Or the other one is, what are the deliverables, they'll ask me. Yes. Yeah, that's the other thing. Like, I'm like, what do you think? I mean, I, I sometimes wonder, you know, really like which planet they come from, you know? So, I mean, how does one explain the deliverable? I mean, you could even ask this question, right? Uh, let's ask an economic question. What is an artist's contribution to the GDP of a country? Forget about art sales, two crores for a painting. Forget about that. Forget about that very basic level. But by me becoming an artist and practicing every day, performing, other than the fact that I pay tax, I pay GST, whatever, what is my contribution to the economic development of the country? You probably say negligible, right? So, but let's ask this question. By listening to music, by, I'm, I'm answering now first in a very productive, in a, in a productivity way, purposely, okay? Say by listening to music or going to an art gallery or by seeing something. First, how much more productivity have you increased as an engineer? You know, how much more are we, are we able to spend on work? How much more have you able to think creatively? Maybe the greatest innovations come after a tune of Beethoven of a composition of Tyagaraja or of listening to Ilya Raja or after listening to Berman or who knows? Or after walking and, and listening to the ball sing. Are you giving a percentage of your innovative product to those people who inspired you? Or to the tunes that you listen to a street, or the fact that you saw one little uh, pain, or little column in front of a house, and that column design said, "Wow, there's something." Are you contributing to that? Those are all all acts of art. How does one quantify that? You can't. Or theater. If a society is full of art, active, compet, you know, competing ideas, contesting ideas, then there is a regeneration of the mind. There is a freshness of thought. There is also calmness and peace if you seek that. There are so many things that change society from inside out through art that contribute in very, 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 very literal things. This is one. Two, life cannot be reduced only to the amount of money that somebody is contributing. If that is the way we are going to reduce life, our existence as societies have to be questioned. Why do we collectives? Why do we share? Why do we smile at each other? Why should we smile? There's no benefit from me walking on the street and smiling at somebody. There's no benefit. Why should we embrace? Because 
our life is about cohabitation our life is about emotional exchanges about emotional recognitions about sensitivity about you know uh, sometimes expressing without knowing mm -hmm. you know and that's the most beautiful moments in our lives and if that is life then that is where art exists breathes and if you're looking for transformations, you know, like so societal transformations, like the question you asked, right? You do so, you know, you want to, some people call it activisty art, whatever that means. You know, have you, tell me how many people have changed because of that. No. Sometimes it may take a generation. Sometimes it may take two. You and I may never see it. Nobody may talk about me 20 years later. Or it may not be connected with an act you did or I did. But again, goes back to that idea. We are, as long as it's part of a continuum of movement, it is happening. And most important, let us just let it happen. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. I, I think some of the conversations are reminding of my teacher, Hindi teacher, who had defined, I mean, he was very philosophical. He said, um, uh, when you are in a cold wind, you are in a cold wind, and you don't know how to get out of the cold wind, and you don't know how to Yes. And that is what he said. That's true. And, and and that's how you seem to have said that let's do it. Let's do it. And we will see the change. And that distance that when we are fully drenched may not happen in our lifetime. Yes. It may yes. happen later. Yes. And um, yeah, again, thank you very much for that sort of explaining the trajectory of it because that's a question which you asked. Now I, I would like you to help us with something which uh art has played an important role. Uh Protests are being reinvented. Protests are new. I mean, there is a talk about end of the regular protests, but we have seen all types of protests. Oh, yeah. I, I would like uh, you to help us think about uh, if, we, if you have ideas and you've thought about it, uh, how do you think the idea of protest will change? Uh, because you are an artist too, but how does art play a role? Can we throw ideas about the new ways to protest? We think Media House, the Edina, is a way of protest and dissent. We want to aggregate community voices. Yeah. What do you think are new ways we need to think and how to involve art? Uh, is there a reason to rethink and how, how would you like? Can I just uh, share your frame it a little bit? I, I mean, uh, um, rather than calling it protest, let's call it conversations. Okay. okay. Yeah. Fair. Okay. I'm just reframing it. Uh, you can call it the protest. I think something that we have lost is the ability to have conversations today. Okay. And a protest is a conversation. Mm -hmm. A protest is a conversation. And what is a protest? See, there is always an audience for a protest. A protest is, there is always an audience. Okay. When the audience appears, at what moment that interaction happens, the different, different thing altogether. Mm -hmm. Like if I am a visual artist, I may make a piece of uh, art here at my house. Okay, at that moment, it's only me and that piece of art, whether it is, you know, a sculpture or a painting. The moment that piece of art goes to a gallery or a public space, then that piece of art, what I have, shall we say, put into it, starts talking to somebody else. So that's a conversation. Until then, it is not in con conversation with society. So that moment can vary, right? But the fact is a protest is a conversation. And the question that bothers me is not even kinds of protests. I think technology has a role in this. I think you're going to have different shapes and sizes and, and varieties in, uh, coming. But if we are going to shut ourselves from listening, right? And I think that is something that we are doing very quickly now. And I think social media, the internet has a role to play. That's the irony of the whole thing. Something that was supposed to be the most democratic platform where anybody considered one time the equalizer has now turned to be the most oppressive uh, mechanism that we ever had. Right? Mm -hmm. Because fundamentally, we forget one thing. Tech cannot change the world. Only human beings can change the world. Tech can do nothing. Right? So we think you, you plug something with a technological solution, you've solved the problem. No, you've not because you have not changed. So I think that is something we need to address is how do we aggregate, to use your question, uh, your, your word, 
how do we aggregate diverse voices and how do we create an environment where we can listen to each other? You know, I think I struggle with it. Everybody struggles with it. So how can we do that? Because then protest seems to have more meaning. Even if we disagree, if we can see each other, forget about listen, even if we can see each other, because we know families are being torn apart, have been torn apart. Friends don't talk to each other. The language that we use with each other in disagreement is not something I have heard when I grew up. Mm. I don't think I've heard it. And I'm not imagining this. Sometimes I wonder whether we're like, you know, imagining this. No, but I remember very clearly, this is not what I what I heard. So there is some, there is a very basic fabric of societal building, which is seeing each other, listening to each other, talking to each other, which I think is now very, very, very uh, thin. Very, very it's delicately poised. So the, the question I want to raise is, how do we change that? So this can be from the tone we use in the conversations, even the vocabulary that we probably use in the conversation. I'm not saying a monolithic vocabulary. I'm not talking about a monolithic tone. I'm just saying, is there something there that we need to reimagine? Creativity, you know? It's not about packaging. It is about how. How do we create Let's look okay, at let, let me just go back. Okay. There are you know people who have very, very parochial views. Sometimes to the point of where you don't even know how to get through. I mean, we all choose our battles in those cases. Sometimes we just don't fight certain battles. We say get done with it. But if I want to say slightly differently, say a person who's very parochial, very angry, uh, you know, uh, hates communities, whatever, whatever. Okay. Now the fact one true. You, we can say, yes, that man is poisoned, his brain has been brainwashed, his environment has taught him this, all this is true. But is it not true that the fear that person feels is real? Yeah. That's true. We can reason that that fear is unfounded, we can say that is wrong, we can give 100x, we can say the caste is a problem, We can all that is accepted, but the fear is true. Can I have a conversation with that fear? Beautiful. That is what I feel I am struggling with individually. I am still searching for vocabulary to have a conversation with that fear because I also have fears. So the moment I have fears and you have, shall, shall we say, contesting fears, right? Then we are never talking. We are just, the two fears are just pegged against each other. So I am, so-called arguments we have are not arguments. Just think about what we say. We are presenting our fears to that person saying, if this is mm. true, then this is what's going to happen to us. This is what will happen to society. This is our oh, fear. Yeah. The person is saying, no, but this is what is happening to me, my community, whatever, blah, 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 blah. That is his fears. So where are we actually talking to each other? I think this is something we need to think about. Because if we can find, and I think this is where art can play an incredible role because art removes the literality out of this. I don't have to give you a case study. You don't have to give me a case study, anecdote from here. You give me an anecdote. All true. None of them are, you know, we also know one funny thing, you know, uh, not so funny, but funny, is that the two anecdotes that are being, being given for arguments, right? Both anecdotes are true. But you are forced to choose only one anecdote. Both sides, I'm not saying one side, both sides are forced to choose only one anecdote. Because that anecdote, ex ex uh, you know, exemplifies your fear. This anecdote exemplifies his fear. Here, art can play an incredible role. Because it can it dissolve this and create something common, an object here that both are viewing. So art is a situation where the two individuals are here are not bouncing against, against each other, but they are open now and they're looking at a third thing. Hmm. The moment you're looking at a third thing, you are not fighting with each other. Your fear is having interaction with an object. Then when you turn back to each other, there's a possibility that something loosens up in that conversation. I think that's where art has a role, whether it's poetry, whether it's singing, whether it's, you know, protest songs, anything, anything, you know, from across the social spectrum, I think 
this is what art can do beautiful thank you uh, thank you one last question i, I think uh, it's uh, when we go to a protest uh, when the ca protest ha happened maybe the main people who really felt it were the, the minorities the muslims people from other community came and created solidarity there are many times people are asking questions for their for something which they felt is not just mm -hmm. and the others join and that's solidarity yeah and there is also an idea of ally shape like how you become an ally and sometimes some people are more privileged in one regard with respect to the other sometimes some people are just privileged in every regard in some ways uh, how does one and you have you know brought in lots of new i mean i would say new words of conversations uh, in this sort of ally shape and would you be able to help us guide what is ally shape and what should we be looking for and maybe what we shouldn't be looking for i think you also mentioned that if you could help us uh, so first i think for most of us let's remember that allyship itself is a privilege yes i mean the reason you can be an ally and 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 be this because you're privileged I mean, for many cases i mean those who are allies and not privileged are extraordinary human beings okay first of all let me say they're extraordinary human beings i am not an extraordinary human being so i am i'm able to be an ally this goes back to it reminds me of a of a little anecdote when uh, in one of our endeavors and you know uh, we were having this conversation in our group after we went and cleaned the beach etc and uh, one of the volunteers among the group who kind of came from privilege was very disturbed that the people of the village did not come and volunteer with us to take the garbage off the beach they said what is this we are coming on a sunday morning we are going and taking all the garbage of their beach they are not coming so one of the uh, one of our volunteers also resident of that village from that village rather he said what are you talking about they have to go sell bajji that day being a volunteer is a privilege don't forget that that you can take off time to go and clean the beach he is not some great soul service to society you have the privilege to take off time and go and clean the beach in many cases allyship is very similar that you have the privilege to say that i will stand with somebody who does not have or is being victimized etc so it has to come with humility first allyship has to come with humility okay and allyship also must come from position of saying i don't know i don't know but does allyship mean i speak the words of say the individual i'm allying with not necessarily i don't agree with that allyship can be my own words it may be even wrong but let that wrong play out if you accept that if if in the interaction we we limit accept that x a person is an ally making an attempt an honest attempt to be part of a conversation to learn from a certain conversation to also stand with but still making mistakes i think that also needs to be accepted as part of allyship because allyship cannot be a a monochrome no allyship also needs multiple colors and shades it needs that and it only then there is learning also that is happening otherwise everybody is play acting i think i think one of the dangers of of uh, the way we look at progressive politics today is the fact that we all want to be politically correct and i think that's a problem i know this sounds little off to some people probably what are you trying to say no i think it's a problem because we are all play acting then we are all part of a drama we all know for example how to say things where to say things what not to say what is the term to use we all know it today by today we all know it we will also develop new vocabulary as vocabulary develops but do we feel every one of those words or do we feel like a word we don't use but are we using are using another word because we know within the progressive community i'll get a certificate what are we doing so is this honest the tough question and i believe many of us are not because we are scared to be called out what is wrong get called out what is wrong because only then you're going to learn you're not going to act and i feel this drama that is we are also playing out in the progressive world in the name of progressiveness and allyship is a danger to honesty is a danger to real progressiveness is a danger to it also negates complicated conversations 
it negates learning because we are all making sure once a new article has come saying this is what the new frame is okay we like adopted the frame tomorrow something else will come adopted that frame no that's not how it be i think that allyship also means if a person is accepted as an ally it means that ally is also going to make mistakes sure super yeah, yeah. thank you uh, i would like to end with one last question uh, you said there is a sense of relief uh, and the news of arindhati roy uh, makes us feel maybe it's not real you said relief and real uh, as we as we do this trajectory what do you think as citizens as artists as people who have uh, spoken with a sense of dissent of what was happening what is our role now and uh, uh, where does it i mean no we have now understood that it's not just voting is not just the only thing which a citizen should do can you help us frame uh, what we should be what is our role and responsibility as we see the re relief to the real happening i mean yeah i mean we call ourselves a participatory democracy uh, which means voting is just one event in one moment if you want to go back to the words we use one moment in the movement of of life uh, unfortunately we have not thought about uh, our being in that manner and i think that's a cultural baggage that we carry the word politics which we discuss already um so first governments come and go people come and go but on if we want to really address the problems that we have that come to the fore in the last 10 years or plus we need to be real and say that these problems didn't appear 10 years ago these problems have existed for a long time and that is something that as civil society members as people who work in the area of culture and art we need to remember because our work is cut out for two decades plus i don't you know irrespective who's in government irrespective of that because you know this whole thing that everything seemed okay till 2014 and something just turned one switch was put on 2020 is not true 2014 allowed for all of us to see how 2014 and post allowed us to see how violent our inner minds are in reality this is the truth and i am not going to jump and say we were this great democracy till 19th no we were not we are not a lot of things went in a certain direction because certain things sustained itself but there was always an underlying movement which was parochial which was discriminative which is casteist remains casteist gender discriminative you know uh, anti minority this has always been there we just opened the box to say you can do what you want about it say what you want about it you can be blatant about it you can slap another person you can kill another person you can bulldoze houses you can do whatever you want and we will not touch you that meant we could just go to the wild side of ourselves so 2024 is important but 2024 24 is not the be all and end all of our work it's given us hope that still there is a possibility to to seek a more humane society but it also means that we must go to the core of the problems not just solve it at electoral levels we must be willing to dig within ourselves how much are we i mean how much conversations are multiple societies and communities having in in an everyday life how many contexts are we creating you know this is a word we use now in in you know psychologists use it sociologists use it, safe space how many safe spaces exist for people to come and just discuss these things talk these things how many spaces exist none exist today can we create them can villages be places where you know i had this dream of having a cultural hub in every village a cultural hub that will be about song theater music art old new religious non religious i don't care about all categories but children from young children from grade 1 and grade to grade 5 or grade 6 will come in the evening sit together and just do art across community caste lines gender lines you know and then you can talk 
abstract idea of sort of secularism, justice. You can talk about all that. But we need, I will say, such hubs in every village where children are participating in collective art, uh, activities. Children are understanding why we call ourselves we the people. You know, I think those kind of efforts that are sustainable, that are at local levels, have to have to come everywhere, in every village, in every town. If you do this over two decades with no with watching carefully that bigotry does not set in, I think in two decades you'll have a far more combative and a conversationist society. You'll have a society that's at, at no point going to say, it's fine you if you bulldoze somebody's house. It's fine if you kill somebody. You, you get there and you've got to a very good place. If you can all come together and say those simple things, we can say caste cannot exist. Full stop. No ifs and buts. There's no ifs and buts. Everybody has a right to live their life the way they want. Everybody can marry irrespective of their sexual preferences of gender or gender. If we can get to that point where we agree on these things, <laughs> then rest can rest is not a problem. But to get there, we need a culture. We need cultural transformation, not just political transformation. Which means that's why I feel we need hubs in villages where ethical living, cohabitation. I don't like the word tolerance. I prefer the word embrace. You have to be an embracing society. And for that, it has to happen over a couple of decades, irrespective of which political party is in power. Thank you so much. And on a lighter note, I will leave the conversation on this part that if I had to use a KPI for this interview, the number of questions which TMK has left against the questions I did is much, much more than one. For every question I put, he put 10. Or are, you going to, are you going to monetize that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's wonderful. And I think uh, it's an amazing conversation. I think each of them can literally be another thread of conversation. But I, I really like that because that's what you said, uh, that every question should lead to another question. And I think, uh, so I, thank you so much to the audience who will uh, hear us. And thank you so much, Tim Krishna, for listening uh, you know, listening to the questions and answering it with patience. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you. Matashto Vishesha video Galanu Nodalu, Matu Hosa video Galabagatilu, Edina.com YouTube channel subscribe Madi, Matu bell icon click Madi.